Okay, everyone. Today I have a very special guest for you guys. His name is Will from Steam Cell. He's going to show us how to do the integral of one over c over some count two. And yes, he's going to talk about the Cauchy residency room by the end of the video. So be sure you guys watch the whole thing. And if you guys like this video, be sure you guys come to his channel and check out his other videos. Especially as you guys can see, he does have a video solution to the three blue one bronze counting problem. I think many of you guys know what this is already. And you can also see he has other interesting topics in mathematics as well. So if you guys like his videos, be sure you guys go subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you guys so much. And now let's welcome Will. Our challenge is to integrate the function 1 over z along a circular contour c. Usually when we solve integrals, we're only integrating along the x-axis because functions that depend on a single variable, like x, are only defined on that axis. This integral is going off-road, and we better hope that our function is defined everywhere on c. Even though in our case, it looks like we have just another function of a single variable z. You and I know that the letter z is really a hint that we're talking about complex numbers. Any complex number can be written in the form r e to the i theta, and can be thought of either as a vector of length r making an angle theta with the x-axis, or as the spot on the graph that the vector is pointing to. So this two-dimensional space is full of complex numbers, and I can't see any reason why 1 over z would be undefined on c. For example, our circular contour of radius A intersects the positive real axis at A and the positive imaginary axis at A times I. At the point A, 1 over Z is just 1 over A, and at the point A times I, 1 over Z is just 1 over A times I. As fascinating as all this is, it doesn't really help us to solve the integral. So we're going to make it easier on ourselves by dividing the circle up into n linear chunks. Then we're going to find the value of the integral on each of the linear pieces and sum them together to approximate the integral on the circle. The more chunks we divide the circle into, the better the approximation is going to be, and as the number of chunks increases to infinity, the approximation is going to get better and better and better until it converges to the exact answer. As the first step to finding the integral on each of these pieces, we're going to need to know what the value of the function is on each of them. If the pieces are small enough, that's going to be very close to the value of the function on the circle. Let's be a little wild and use the value of the function halfway along the circular arc cut out by each chunk. That's at the points z1, z2, z3, and so on. By the way, notice how they divide the circle up into equal sectors of angle phi. Now that we have an approximate value of the function on each of the linear pieces, Normally, the next thing to do would be to multiply that value by the length of each piece. But each piece is actually a vector, it has a length and it also has a direction. Complex numbers are great at representing vectors, and so each piece, delta i, can be expressed as a complex number. Because we're doing complex integration, we're going to multiply the complex number f of z i by the complex number delta i. This is all starting to sound a bit complicated. Ho ho. And so let's expand out the sum and work through it term by term. The first term is f of z1 times delta 1. That's 1 over z1 times delta 1. And z1 is just the point at the intersection between the circle and the real number line that we've seen before. 1 over z1 is just 1 over a. Delta 1 is a little more tricky. It's a vector whose length is roughly equal to the arc of the circle that lies next to it, which is a times phi. And it's at an angle of pi over 2 radians to the real axis. And so delta 1 is equal to a times phi multiplied by e to the i pi over 2. Hmm, it seems like we can cancel the a's out. So the first term is equal to phi times e to the i pi over 2. Let's move on to the next term. Well, the magnitude of z2 is just a, the radius of the circle again, but its angle has increased by phi. That makes f of z2 equal to 1 divided by a times e to the i phi. Delta 2 has the same magnitude as delta 1, and its angle has also increased by phi. So delta 2 is equal to a times phi 
multiplied by e to the i pi over 2 plus phi. The same deal as the last time, the a's cancel. But now we get an extra cancellation for free. e to the i phi on top cancels with the e to the i phi on the bottom. So the second term is just equal to the first term. Surely we can only dream that the same thing is going to happen to the third term. The magnitude of both f of z3 and delta3 are the same as they were before. But z3 is another phi radians around the circle than z2, so that makes e to the i 2 phi. But delta3 also increases its angle by phi. We get the same things cancelling this time to get phi times e to the i pi over 2. And the same is true all the way along, right up until the nth term. That just means we have n times phi times e to the i pi over 2. It seems pretty simple, right? Well, it's not quite simple enough for me yet. Phi, which divides the circle up into equal sectors, is just 2 times pi over n. And e to the i pi over 2? Well, that's i by another name. That gives 2 times pi times i. And when we take the limit of this as n goes to infinity, nothing changes. It remains 2 pi i, which gives us our answer. What we've just done is prove a special case of something called Cauchy's Residue Theorem. It's actually a really deep piece of mathematics. The full theorem says that the integral of an analytic function f around a closed contour c is equal to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues enclosed by that contour. Uh, okay, this residue stuff sounds a bit unsanitary. What is it? Well, if a function ever goes off to plus or minus infinity, the residue tells you something about how exactly it gets there. For example, in our case, we had a singularity at the origin. When z is equal to 0, we have 1 over 0, which is equal to infinity. The residue of this singularity happens to be 1. And so the value of the function around the contour c is 2 pi i, just like we showed. But notice that the theorem doesn't actually say that the contour has to be a circle. It can be any shape, as long as it contains the same singularities. So, according to the theorem, the value of the integral along any of these contours is just the same, 2 times pi times i. Thank you very much to Black Pen Red Pen for hosting me on his channel. I hope you enjoyed the video. This is the kind of stuff that I produce on my channel, so if you like it, please check it out and subscribe. You have two blocks next to a wall. One block is moving towards the wall and the other block. Then they collide. After the collision, both blocks are probably still moving towards the wall. But there is another equation, and that equation is the conservation of momentum. I mentioned it earlier. Now we just need to find the angle of the sector created by our first collision. This is looking good.